Good morning. Revelation chapter 19, <clears throat> beginning in verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in the linen, fine linen, and white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, <clears throat> and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of lords. Our Father, our God, we thank you that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, as we come to you this morning into thy word, we pray that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct us, as always. Lord, teach us your word this morning, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In verses 11 through 21, though I didn't read uh, 17 to 21, we're looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ. This passage from verse 11 to the end of the chapter launches the close of human history. When Jesus is done, it's over. Human history is gone. He sets up the millennial reign after this. No more human history. Kind of hard to believe, huh? Because when you look at human beings on planet Earth, we've been on this Earth a long time. And for it to end, boom, gone. Sometimes that's tough to comprehend. But this is what this passage is all about. The final and climatic war upon the Earth is coming. The battle that destroys all the ungodly, destroys all the evil upon the earth, the battle that ushers in the righteousness of God upon planet earth. Finally, there'll be righteousness on planet earth. No more sinfulness, no more evil. It's all going to be taken care of by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus himself will fight the battle. Did you notice that? We're not going to fight the battle. He is. This is his battle. His alone to conquer. That's very important. And this scene is the picture of Jesus Christ coming to earth as a conquering warrior. He came in love the first time. Amen? Amen. At Calvary, he displayed the whole love for the whole human world. Now, he's coming back as a conqueror. Yes, there are times when God is loved. But there are times when God says, that's it, it's over. I'm coming to conquer. And this is what this passage is all about. I want you to notice this morning that Jesus Christ... The names and the titles in verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he sat upon him, was called faithful and true, and in righteousness does he judge and, what? Make war. That's kind of hard for us to comprehend, doesn't it? We're so used to preaching on the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. Now we see the other side of Jesus Christ. He's coming to make war. There's, you know, it's just a matter of time when God is sick of sin. He has to do something. He's doing it in these passages. Now notice Jesus will be a conquering Christ here. This is symbolized by a white horse. Why a white horse? 
Well, when you study ancient times, a Roman general entered a city at, when he conquered it, and he rode upon a white horse. And that white horse uh, was, was known as a conquering horse. The, the conqueror, the Roman general, rode on a white horse to celebrate his triumph. When Jesus comes, man can depend on two things this morning. Number one, Jesus will be the faithful and true conqueror. Did you catch those titles? He is the faithful and true conqueror. Faithful here means that he can be trusted and relied upon. Amen? There's only one person you can trust this morning and rely on, and that's Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord. Amen? Amen. We can't, we really can't trust the human beings because every now and then human beings will fail us. That sometimes that happens, doesn't it, in life? Sometimes you'll put your whole trust in somebody and all of a sudden, bam! They turn, they, they turn you, they turn on you and you're thinking, man, what did I do? All of a sudden, I was once their friend and now I'm their enemy. That's just part of human nature. That happens. But there's one who is totally faithful, amen, to us as born-again believers, and that's Jesus Christ. And notice also, he's the judge of every enemy when he comes. True here means true as opposed to false. So in other words this morning, the conquest and the judgment of Jesus Christ will be true. Jesus Christ will meet out exactly what a person deserves. Remember, he's coming as conqueror and, and judge. Every person will be judged by the righteous judge, Jesus Christ. Amen? And that will be a true judgment. Not like today's judicial system. It, it's not perfect. Sometimes it makes mistakes. And sometimes we're biased. In that judgment call, and I've been in, I've been in enough court as a counselor to see that. Holy, I can't believe that that they got away with that. I can't believe that, that they said that. It wasn't a real good judgment call, okay? But Jesus, when he judges, remember, he knows human beings, and he'll give them their just due without any partiality, without any prejudice, it'll be a true judgment. Amen? Amen? Every ungodly and evil person can count on Jesus being true and judging in perfect justice. Jesus will judge and make war upon the earth. Notice, in righteousness. It's very important. In righteousness. In other words, his righteousness will be the criteria. The law by which all shall be judged. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, verse number 27. The Bible says here, For the Son of Man shall come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall and then he shall reward, watch this, reward every man according to his what? Work. Work. <clears throat> Remember, believer, this morning, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to give an account for everything you've done. And the work you thought you did. was right, maybe it was done in self-centeredness, he'll make it right that day. You'll deserve the work, the true work that you've done for him, and he'll judge that work according to what? Righteousness. A right judgment. Look at, Revel remember Revelation chapter 20? When we get to chapter 20 and verse number 12. The Bible says this, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their what? Works. Works. 
It's a serious judgment. When God judges, it's a right ju justice. It's justice, it's perfect, and it's pure. And by the way, there'll be no excuses. You, you, you won't have any excuses during that day. He will not hear it. See how important it is to serve Christ? With the right motive. All it takes is a wrong motive. Boom, you've lost your reward. So the question needs to be asked this morning, believer. Whatever we do, include myself, whatever we do, it better be with the right motive. And that motive is to bring glory and honor to who? That's right. Not ourselves. It doesn't take much to lose a reward. So the next time you're thinking about doing something for the Lord, you must ask, we must ask ourselves, what's my motive behind this? Is it pure? Is it just? Is it the right cause? Or is it all for me? We gotta think about that, amen. Because the one thing you you gotta realize this morning. The unsaved are going to be judged and sent to hell, but the believers are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, and you can't fool Christ during that time. He sees everything. He knows what you do, and he knows why we do it. Think about that. That's how important this is. Here in this passage, the unsaved are not going to get away with anything. They're all going to die. Every one of them. Do you realize this morning, millions upon millions upon millions of people are going to die. It's over. Human history is over. Christ has had it. The one person you don't want to get mad, to get mad at, don't let Christ get mad at you. Not even as a believer, you don't want him mad at you. Because he can pour down that old chastisement very quickly notice here also Jesus Christ will be the consuming prince I like that the consuming prince you'll see here in verse number 12 his eyes were a flame of fire and on his head were many what crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, in the, these crowns, he's the consuming prince. I want you to notice a threefold description of Christ this morning in this passage. Number one, his eyes will be like what? A flame, flame of fire. This symbolizes a piercing, penetrating power. He sees things everywhere. Even in the dark. Just when mankind thinks he can do uh, in the dark things that God doesn't see, sure he can. God sees everything in light and also in darkness. Man does strange things in the nighttime, doesn't he? Why? Because he hides it. That's why everything's done at night. Most people don't do wicked things during the day. It's always at night, where, where it's dark, where you can't be seen, where you think you can get away with it. Sometimes mankind does get away with it. But remember, his eyes are a flaming fire. He sees everything everywhere. He knows all, and he will conquer all e uh, evil. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, I want you to notice... Verse number 13. It says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his what? Sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So in other words, you can't hide from God. I get <laughs> Yeah, I love the Old Testament, and one of the characters that, that I find intriguing is Jonah. Now, Jonah thought he could hide from God. Oh, yeah. I, I kind of chuckle with that. Well, 
I think I'll just pay, get a ticket. I'll, I'll just go out in the boat. And uh, I'm going to, you know, God will never find me out here. Yeah. Don't you think God knew where he was? See, take a boat, go to the mountain, go down in the deepest sea. I don't care where you go. You can't get away from God. Do you actually think you can hide for, in creation when he created it all? He knows every deepest spot. He knows every cave. He knows every, every hiding place on planet Earth. Well, he created it all. So he knows where we are at all times. It's interesting to see that uh, things like that happen. Notice he'll be wearing many crowns in verse 12. That is the royal crown of rule and authority over many kingdoms. Remember, he's coming to conquer. And he's going to conquer all nations, kings and kingdoms, and take their crown. He's coming to conquer all of the kingdoms of the earth. He will have a name also in verse 12 that's interesting. Somewhere on his clothing, he has a name. And notice the scriptures, he alone, what? Knows that name. Nobody else does. So, that's one of those passages where, you, where, you know, just leave the scripture alone. Oh, <laughs> I've seen many theological battles. Well, I think the name... You don't know the name. Only Christ does. So it's frutal to guess what it will be. We will see it one day. So don't try to put something into Scripture that is what? Not there. That's where he, all these dumb theological doctrines come about when man tries to put something into Scripture that's not there. And that's where people get in a lot of trouble. Notice also Jesus will be the slaughtering word of God in verse number 13. He was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Notice dipped in blood. That's not Christ's blood. He already shed his blood at Calvary. This is the blood of all the millions that he's going to slaughter. His robe will be sprinkled in blood, it says here. This is the blood of his enemies. Jesus is going to conquer and defeat all the ungodly people in the world, evil in the world, and all the kings of the world in their kingdom. People, there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. We see parts and bits of it now, but this is nothing. This is the ultimate destroying of human nature, of human beings upon the earth. And notice here what's interesting that in verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen and white. So what we have here is a conquering Christ. He's going to get all the crowns of the kings and kingdoms. And he's going to conquer it by his word. And also Jesus Christ will be here the heavenly warring leader in verse number 14. You see, the armies of heaven will follow him. Well, who are they? Who are the armies that follow him? Well, of course, they're clothed in what? Fine and white and clean, right? That, that's not too hard to figure out. All right? That's the same clothing that will, that the people wore at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? So who are they? 
They're all the believers in Christ through the centuries, both Old and New Testament believers. We're all coming back. We're going to be behind the conquering Christ while he fights the battle. Wow. I cannot imagine what that, that scene is going to be like. But I'm glad I'm behind him. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not on the opposite end of that. You see, in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword with which should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fiercest and the wrath of Almighty God. Verse 15, you see, Jesus will be a fierce conqueror. This is seen in three things in verse 15. Number one, he'll have a weapon, a sharp what? Sword. That comes out of his what? Hmm. Comes out of his mouth. So whatever's coming out of his mouth has great power, has great that can destroy. And the word of God is the sword of God, isn't it? Now, here's another thing here. Alright, when it says here, Mouth going, a, a, a sharp sword with a, the, the smite the nation. Now, is it a physical sword? I mean, it's, no. no. I mean, Christ is going to spit out swords. If he did, he'd be spitting out millions of swords. And he goes, <laughs> okay. So that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about what? He's talking about the word of what? Power, the same power that spoke the world into existence. When Christ speaks, something's going to happen. And what he's doing here, that sharp sword is very important. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible says, Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of what? The spirit which is the word of God. The word of God. You see, they didn't listen to Jesus' words too much while he was on planet earth during his ministry. But now they, they, will, they will hear his final word. Best obey Christ now and get saved now. Because here, it's too late. And notice here, he'll spite the earth with a rod of iron. He will conquer and subject them all and take his rightful place as the sovereign Lord over the earth and all of its people. Now do you understand Psalm 2? Turn to Psalm 2. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You don't play with Christ. And that's why he says in that same Psalm, in verse 12, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. In other words, you better, you better believe in Christ. You better love him now. You better have compassion. You better caress him now. You better get saved now while you have the chance. Amen? Because one day, he's going to take that iron, that sword of iron, and he's going to destroy you. And then he will execute the fierceness of the wrath of God. In other words, God's wrath is not a pretty sight. When God's wrath comes down upon people of the earth, their time is up.
you see that kind of language in John 3, 36, remember? Turn over to John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. You know what I love about God? He's balanced. So you notice the first part. Believe in me, you'll have what? Eternal life. If you don't, then you're subject to my wrath. God always gives human beings a chance. If you're not saved this morning, you still have a chance to come to Christ and get eternal life. Or do you rather prefer the wrath of God? The problem is people don't take that seriously. They don't take it seriously. I'm not picking on young people this morning, but you know, young people are the ones that don't usually don't take it seriously. Oh, I got plenty of life. I mean, I'm I'm 21 years old and I got my whole life ahead. You don't know that. I've never seen a generation of young people that flatly don't care about God. They don't care about their eternal destiny. They don't care about anything but themselves. Do you realize this morning, even elderly, I've seen elderly too with the same attitude. You have to take your life and your soul seriously because when you die it's not over if you think you're just here and poof you're gone and that's it then the world has suckered you terribly but when you are created you have a spiritual part of you that lives for all eternity either with God in heaven or with the devil in hell one of the two. Here, in this part of our scripture, Jesus looked down as the conquering warrior and said, the world now hasn't taken me seriously. I'm coming. They're doomed. They're doomed. Jesus will be, according to verse 16, what? The Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Wow. In other words, Jesus is the sovereign King, the sovereign Lord of the universe. See, the problem with mankind is they, they think they own the universe. But we don't. Jesus owns this planet. We don't. <laughs> And it's by God's grace every day that we can survive in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. You say, well, Pastor, no, no, that's not true. Oh, really? Well, what if uh, we woke up one day and all of a sudden there's no sun for about a year? Well, what happened to the crops? What would happen to all animal kingdom? What if it, we woke up and all of a sudden it rained more than the days of the flood? God provides the water. He provides the sun. He provides the air we breathe. Amen. We don't owe nothing. We can't survive without him. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. No one exists except by his will. No one shall be allowed to be a citizen of his kingdom unless they have his approval. If you think you can enter the kingdom of God your way, wake up. It's his kingdom. And he made the rules to get there. So if you want to enter into God's kingdom, you're going to have to come God's way through Jesus Christ's wonderful Son. Amen? Amen. It 
So it's very important that man understands this. Then notice verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Hmm. This is the great battle, the final battle of human history here. Jesus returns to earth and destroys ungodly work, the evil of the world, the battle of Armageddon is also called that. It's also called the great day of Jehovah in Scripture. The day of the Lord it's called. The end of the devil's rule on earth. And notice these passages in verse 17 to 21. Notice the, the supper of the great God, verse 17 and 18. Then there's a mobilization of the world's forces, verse 19. The capture of hostile vo forces in verse 20. The judgment of hostile vo forces in verse 20. And the weapon of victory in verse 21. Notice here, this supper differs entirely from the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a different supper. This supper is not a good one. This is the supper of the great God. It is for unbelievers. It will be the most terrifying moment in human history. Notice in verse 17 and 18, a mighty angel cries with what? A loud voice. And he and he cries his voice to all the birds of the air to come to this great supper. Right? Notice it? Of the great God. Why birds? It's obvious, people. Because God is going to destroy all of human beings, the godless nations, and their armies. God is going to end human life on earth. The birds are going to eat and feast upon the dead bodies of all the people and the horses that they're upon. You're talking about millions of people, and so God's calling upon all the birds to what? Eat them all up. You know how many birds that's going to be? You're talking millions of birds. Ezekiel 39 will tell you that, verse 4, and also verse 17 through 20. Remember, Jesus is going to conquer all the world. Armageddon will be mobilizing of the world's army in verse number 19. And I saw the beast, the dictator, Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, that's Christ, that sat on the horse, and against his army. <laughs> You see, the Antichrist is there. The kings and the leaders of the world are all, and all their armies are there to make war against who? Christ. They still don't get it. Can you imagine being one of those army people and seeing Christ coming out, out of the clouds and all millions of us behind him? I mean, what are they thinking? So what you have here, the Antichrist is there. And this is the point I want to make this morning. How is it possible for so many armies to gather in one place? And if a war is going to be fought in Palestine, why bother with foot soldiers when the world has so many sophisticated weapons? Well, all of us in the military know why been in the military, you can have all the sophisticated weapons you want, but you need boots on the ground to secure it. Armies use foot soldiers when they want to preserve the land and its resources. You have to have boots on the ground. The Antichrist will lead his eastern 
alliance against Palestine to totally exterminate the Jews and fight against the followers of Christ. Did you notice here how did all the armies of the world get to Palestine? They got there the same way they would today. What do you mean, Pastor? If some major army began to march and claim want to get all the oil in the Middle East right now, what would happen? All the nations of the world would come together and stop it. They would stop it. They'd stop the march into the Middle East. The nations would stop it. They would protect it, their interests. Don't forget, every nation has an interest over there in the Middle East, and it's the oil. It's oil. But remember, the Battle of Armageddon will be judged, <coughs> according to the scripture, and the armies of the world will gather in Palestine. Because of this evil spirit behind the Confederation of Nations, remember Revelation 16? The Antichrist and his alliances will be there at Armageddon. The kings of the east will be there. That's the Arabs, China, and all eastern nations will be there. Keep your eyes on China. She's going to be there. I don't care how many treaties our president makes. China, we better be, watch out for China. They have the biggest army in the world. All the kings of the north, that's Russia, and all the kingdoms north. Notice how Russia now is coming up, China's coming up. The south, that's all the nations of Africa. That's why there's so much terrorism in Africa right now. They want to control Africa. The west, that's all the European nations, America, and Canada. All these nations are going to be involved with the Battle of Armageddon. This is all accomplished by evil deception coming from the Antichrist, Revelation 16 and Revelation chapter 12. How are you going to get all of these nations together to fight against Christ? Deception. How many times have I said from the pulpit, don't trust any politician? I don't care who they are. Because deception is powerful. That's why, when I put this all together at the end of the book, that's why they don't like born again believers. That's why they want to shut us down. That's why they will shut down the churches. They will come in. Why? Because we're not deceived. We know what's going on. We know the program. It's in the book. I'll get to that later. One, one of the things that I want us to pray for is a church. How are they going to close down churches? How are they going to take over churches? Very simply. We are a tax-exempt corporation. C1, what is it called? C130, something like that? 501. Yeah, 501, something like that. That was, who gave that to us? The government. They're going to use that to get into the church eventually. I know that for a fact. They're going to come in and say, well, since we gave you this privilege, now you're going to listen to us. Or... Yeah, see what I'm saying? So what am I saying to pray for? If, that, if I think that's going to happen in the future, then let's get out of that. Yeah. <laughs> the only downside of that, we'll have to pay taxes on the building, that's all. That's all it is, tax-free, we want to pay taxes. But at least if that happens in the future, just pray about it, at least they can't come in and tell us what to do. No, 
We don't have that status anymore with your government. We're going to do what God tells us to do. Either way, you're going to see persecution. And notice verse 20. The simple and quick capture of the hostile forces in verse 20. The Lord shall slay the Antichrist with the spirit out of his mouth. What is that spirit out of Jesus' mouth? It is the spirit of truth, holiness, and unlimited power. Jesus speaks, and the wicked are what? Consumed. Now, how does how he's going to do it? I don't know. I think he's going to be he's going to come down. They're going to say, "The end of Christ, they destroy," and Jesus is going to say, "You're all dead," and they are. They'll die that instant. He has that power. The glory, the Lord of glory, will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. Amen. The word brightness is very is a very special word, and uh, it refers only to the coming of the Lord. It refers once to His first coming, Second Timothy one ten, and four times to His second coming, in First Timothy six, Second Timothy four, and Titus two thirteen. So, so when Jesus speaks, what ha truth what comes out, and it will happen. When Jesus appears, there will be a laser beam of glory upon the Antichrist and will be immediately destroyed by the radiance of Jesus Christ. According to 1 Thessalonians 4. The word destroyed in 2 Thessalonians 2.8 means to make inoperative, to make powerless. So... There is a horrifying judgment of the Antichrist and the false, in verse 20, the beast was taken with him, the false prophet wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them, received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped the image, his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with what? Brimstone. They will both be cast into the lake of fire. This is the place where all who rebel and reject Christ, the fallen angels, all the believers, the demons, the devil himself, are all condemned. And finally, thrown into that place. And then there is the weapon of the Lord that he used to slay the armies. And the raiment were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their what? Ugh, flesh. Gross. I can't imagine fowls eating all those bodies. Sometimes you really drive down the highway and you see a, a dead thing, and you see these crows coming down. They, well, that's what's going to happen to human beings. And you know what? They deserve it. For all the evil they've done through centuries. What will be the weapon? Well, a sword, the sword of his mouth, the blast of power of his word consumes all that stands before him. When you look at 17 through 21, aren't you glad you're saved? Yes. Aren't you glad you're on the Lord's side? Aren't you glad that when he comes back, we're behind him and he's in front of us? Yes. But what saddens me the most with this picture that I painted this morning is that human beings, for some strange reason, will not believe in Christ. They don't take his word seriously. And what's it going to take for them to believe seriously? I don't know. Only God knows. Amen. But it's going to be a tragic day when human history is finally over. 
comprehend that for a while. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Father, that your Son, Jesus Christ, has control of everything. I thank you so much that the day we got saved, we became part of the family of God. Jesus became our Lord and sovereign God. And I'm thankful, Father, that he fights the battle for us. And so, Lord, I pray there's one here that's not saved, that we give the invitation that they come to Christ. May they, they need to search their soul this morning and take it seriously. They need to meet Christ who can give them eternal life. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.